just the most gorgeous picture of an onion. There it is. So there's the onion. And so last week we started talking about, ooh, if we go deep enough down into the center of the onion, what do we find? Ernest Holmes would say we find the peace that passes all understanding. Of course, in miracles would say we find last presence. Gary Zikoff would say we find the seed of the soul. These two talks, as you know, have been very inspired by the untethered soul by um, Michael Singer, and he calls it the seed of consciousness. But no matter what we call it, it doesn't really matter. This is the place of spiritual enlightenment. That is the place of spiritual enlightenment. And how do we get to be there? Well, as we always hear from speakers all the time, the importance of spiritual practice. Spiritual practice helps us get there. Being kind helps us get there. Being compassionate helps us get there. Being of service helps us get there. So many different ways that help us get there. And then what makes us leave there? Well, the three C's, criticize, compare, and what was the other one? Criticize, compare, and complain. Judgment, righteousness. But that's not today's talk. I will give another talk on what helps us stay there and what helps us come away from there. I shared, let me go back to it. I shared that um, this month's affirmation is, I love and accept myself exactly who I, as who I am. Well, who am I? Who are you? So I'm going to do another little metaphor for who you are and for who I am. In 1954, there was the most incredible find in Thailand. There was a monastery that had been there, they thought, since the 12, 1300s. And in, the, and in 1954, they decided it was a 15-foot clay statue of the Buddha. And it was kind of starting to fall apart, and they wanted to move it. So they decided they were going to move it. So they got a big, you know, crane and all of this. And as they're starting to move it, it starts to crack. And that was a bit puzzling because clay does not reflect light, right? So they put it back down and one of the monks goes over and starts chiseling away. And what do they find under the clay? Gold. Gold. 15 foot of solid gold covered by layers and layers of clay. And what had happened in the 1700s is the Burmese army had invaded Thailand and the monks wanted to preserve their golden Buddha. So they slapped all this clay on it. Well, unfortunately, all the monks were murdered. And so the secret of the golden Buddha died in the 1700s until one day in 1954. And I liken that to us and it really relates to the peeling of the onion. So this is the golden Buddha that for hundreds of years was covered with clay. And we peel away the clay just like we peel away the onion. And what do we find? Solid. And so when we ask ourselves the question, who am I? This is who you are. This is who you are. At the core of all of us, this is who we are. We are solid gold. And unfortunately, we spent years layering it, layering it up with clay, right? And so it's just like the peeling back of the onion. When we peel it back, we get to see the truth of who we are. And how would it be? How would it be if this is how we walk through life? How would it be if we could walk through life without those layers? How would it be if we could walk through life truly as the light that spirit put us here to be? Because each one of you, each one of you is a unique place for the spirit of God to shine through. 
The fabric of God would not be complete without your particular little stitch. So anyway, I just thought that was kind of super cool and another nice visual about which, what we're talking about. So in The Untethered Soul, what Michael Singer does, because I'm going to refer to that book, I really suggest you get it, is he takes us on a journey that begins with a consciousness completely tethered to the ego. And he leaves us with a consciousness completely untethered to the soul. And how beautiful is that? One of the first things, and we laughed about this last week, that he has us look at is our mental dialogue. Give me a thumbs up if you spent any attention this week to your mental dialogue. Was it pretty fascinating? Was it busy in there? Incredibly busy, right? Incredibly busy. And sometimes laughable when we start to have those conversations we're going to have with other people. Um, so anyway, hopefully that you've got some awarenesses from that. But what he reminds us of, what I want to remind us of, is we are not the voice. We are the one that hears the voice. We are the one that notices. He calls it the roommate is talking. Because we are the subject. Our thoughts are the object. The voices are the object. And actually, I was doing some Ernest Holmes studying this week, and Ernest Holmes says exactly the same thing. Ernest Holmes says, our thoughts are things. They are not us. Our thoughts are objects. But we get in trouble because we make everything us, right? Now, he says something wonderful about consciousness. Um, he thinks about consciousness as pure awareness, okay? He thinks about consciousness as pure awareness. And then this is an interesting differentiation. So Michael says, what differentiates a conscious-centered being from a person who is not conscious is simply the focus of their awareness. It is not a difference in consciousness. It is a difference in awareness. I'll say that again. All of his qu quotes seem like, you know, worthy of a second. What differentiates a conscious centered being from a person who is not conscious is simply the focus of their awareness. It is not a difference in consciousness. It's a difference in awareness. Awareness, awareness, awareness. You know, that's what it often keeps coming back to. Awareness, awareness, awareness. He also talks about that we have infinite energy, that we have this wellspring of infinite energy inside of us. And when we're open to it, we feel it. When we're closed, we don't feel it. And if we think about all of the great traditions, they talk about this in Chinese medicine, they call it chi, right? In yoga, yogic tradition, they call it shakti. In the West, we tend to call it spirit. But no matter what we call it, when we open it up, the energy flows. And when we close it, it blocks it. And where that happens a lot is our heart. So something else Michael says about the heart, which I think is interesting. He has a chapter called, a whole chapter called The Secret of the Spiritual Heart. And he says, most of us don't understand the heart. You are not your heart. You are the experience of your heart. You are not your heart. You are the experience of your heart. And a goal he talks about to get to is when our heart starts to close to say no. I am not going to close my heart over this. Nothing is worth closing my heart over this. Now, that's kind of easier said than done. But I do think that most spiritual traditions do teach us that keeping the heart open, no matter what we could think of as spiritual evolution. If somebody can do that, they're pretty spiritually elevated. So what happens, unfortunately, though, and I don't think it just happens to me, but he talks about we have blockages. 
we all have blockages. And he calls them samskaras. He calls them samskaras. And um, it's, it's from a Sanskrit word, which means impressions. Okay. And in the tradition that he studies, what it, it is, is an unfinished energy pattern. So he talks about a samskara as an unfinished energy pattern. So that, what, what that means is, say somebody really pisses me off and hurts my feelings. Okay. And I take it in and I don't really want to feel like it. I don't really want to feel it. So I kind of push it down somewhere and it's stored as an unfinished energy pattern. Does that make sense? Yeah, it's kind of an interesting thing. And what he says they are is the samskaras that we all walk around with, sometimes from when we were itty bitty, are impressions from the past. They are impressions from the past. And so he describes the spiritual journey as the removing of the samskaras. He talks about it as the removing of the thorns. And that's no different than we can talk about the removing of the layers of the onion. It's kind of the same thing. Okay. But it's about having the courage when they come up, not to push them back down, which is what we often do. Right. So how often do we actually say, oh, someone pushed my button? Give me a thumbs up if you ever said that. Well, they may push your button, but they did not install it. And it's really important to remember that while they may push it, they did not install it. What they did was they pushed a button that somehow connected to a samskara inside of you. Something that when we had a choice, am I going to peel the onion when it happens or am I just going to push it way down? We decided to push it way down. And they, they might stay there for a lifetime. They might stay there until some button gets pushed and um, it's up. He says that he believes that most samskaras are related to fear. But he also talks as fear is a thing. Fear is an object. And where fear comes up in the moment, and this is what the whole rest of his book is about, is when fear comes up in the moment, we want to catch it because what happens is when fear comes up, our heart is almost been trained to close, right? And so when fear comes up, we recognize it, fear. Okay, relax my shoulders, relax my heart. Open my heart if I need to feel the feeling and then push it out. But what we often do is we take it in. And that's a choice. When you, and I'm talking about new things coming up so that we don't create new samskaras, okay? So does that make sense? When something comes up, and I think most of us are probably in tune, we feel when our heart starts to close and we go, no. I'm not going to close my heart over this. I'm going to relax my shoulders. I'm going to relax my heart. If I have to feel the hurt for a moment, I will feel it. I will get behind it and I will push it out rather than pushing it down. me. So we always have a choice. We always have a choice. And um, yeah, I had shared last week that um, for years, I gave up peeling onions because they were too incredibly painful for me. So I was, oh, it, and that's a great analogy for pushing away that which is too painful, right? And then, as you know, I discovered onion goggles. And now I can peel an onion and not have to cry. And I likened last week the finding of these to the importance of getting help and not thinking we have to do this journey alone. Because a lot of times when we feel like we're alone and I'm seeing some nodding, how often do we have that happen? Maybe we have something happen and inside we feel like we're dealing with it alone. 
So I just happened to have a story about that. Just happened to have a story. Just before, um, God, I almost forgot what it was called, COVID. <laughs> that thing, COVID. Just before COVID, I had an appointment with my oncologist. Now, most of you probably don't even know that I even have ever had to visit an oncologist, but I did. And it was about the 10 year mark, 10 years beforehand. It had been a very significant journey. Um, yeah. And for probably a good year, maybe a year and a half, and you, when, you, when you get on this journey, you make frequent visits. If you've ever been on this journey or you've supported someone, you feel like you're hanging out in the oncology department all the time. And then the visits get a little longer in between. So I was about 18 months in that journey. I'm single. And I decided I could do this journey by myself now. I don't need anybody. And for eight and a half years, when I had an oncology appointment, I didn't tell anybody. I just would go and do it because in my head, I got this. I don't need anybody. I'm tough. And that was how I would talk to myself. Sometimes the appointments weren't great. For a while, I was having um, spots show up on my lung. It's like, okay, I've got this. So I would go book my, um, what do you call it? Radiation scan. Sometimes I would have to go to the hospital and have nuclear medicine, which was just horrifying. I would wake up in the morning and oh, I'd be a mess. But no, I'm fine. I can do this all by myself. I don't need anybody. I never told anybody I was going. I never reported back to anybody. I do remember I was dating somebody one day, one time. Maybe I've dated people more than one time. But during one time when I was dating somebody, and he asked me what I was doing today. And I kind of let it say, oh, I'm going to do a drive-by of the oncologist. And he said, what do you mean you're doing a drive-by of the oncologist? I said, i got to go see the oncologist. He said, what time? I said, 11. He said, oh, I've got a meeting. And I looked at him and I said, you weren't invited. And he got really offended. <laughs> he got really offended. I said, I'm not inviting you. You know, you don't get to go. And because um, he was like, oh, I could change my appointment. And I kept saying, you're not listening to me. You're not invited. So anyway, back to the, the visit before, um, just before COVID. So I walked in and I sat down. And one of the things that I had realized, because for a long time, I would have a very uncomfortable feeling when I sat down and I wasn't sure what it was. And then I realized it was because when I looked around, most people did not have a healthy head of hair. I was usually one of the only people who had a healthy head of hair. And I would find myself feeling guilty and, you know. So all of a sudden, I had heard this lady say, Deborah. And I turned around, and it was one of those people on that list. You know people that you meet in your life? Maybe you meet them a couple of times socially, and you think when you leave, oh, I could be friends with them, you know? Maybe it doesn't happen, but you know, she was one of those people. And she said, what are you doing here? I said, oh, I'm doing a drive-by, see my oncologist. I said, what are you doing here? And she said, I brought a friend for um, chemo. And she just made this comment. She said, well, why are you here by yourself? And of course, in my cockiness, I'm like, well, I come by myself. I've got this. I don't need anybody to come with me. And she kind of put her hand on my knee. And she said, Deborah, you know, it might be a good idea to think about having somebody come with you. And I started to have this tear fall down my face. And then luckily somebody said, Deborah. So I got to walk off and I was like, Shh. whoa, I almost, almost got emotional then. <laughs> so I went and I had my appointment and I love this incredible oncologist. Her name is Dr. Chan. And she came in and she said, you know what, Deborah? It's been 10 years and I'm cutting you loose. I am cutting you loose. It's like, wow. So I was walking down the lane with a skip in my step and I kind of stopped as I, before I went through the room because I thought, oh, most of these people aren't going to probably get the news I got today, you know? So I walked in and I was happy. So I said, oh, hey, come outside. So I told her what, was, what had happened and how excited I was. And she took my hands 
I've never forgotten this. And she looked into my eyes and she said, Deborah, if ever anything happens like this again, please call me. Please call me. Or please call somebody else. You don't have to do this by yourself. You really don't have to do this by yourself. Well, the next thing that happened was I was sobbing on her shoulder. I was sobbing, just sobbing. Because for all these years when I was tough, well, I've got this, I'm tough, you know, I can do nuclear medicine. Was I tough? Absolutely no. I was just pushing that fear further and further and further away. And if I, it was like if I didn't talk about it to anybody, then maybe it wasn't happening. So I sobbed and sobbed, but I didn't sob for very long. And here's the thing about when we have a samskara come up. When we have a true hurt come up, it, it doesn't take hours of processing. It's kind of like, I call it that pain with no name. When we're sobbing all the time, that's when we're stuck in suffering. And then suffering is when we're suffering about stories about who did what to who. Yeah, then we can cry forever about that. But if we're really in the deepest of our pain and we're bringing up a samskara, it only takes a few moments for it to pass. And I honestly could say, say consciously, I really did think I had it. I really did believe my own story, you know. And then the beautiful thing, I got in my car and I was done with the cancer journey. I was done with it. Yeah. And so that's an example of somebody pushing a button. She didn't install it, but she pushed it. And then it came up. And of course, I felt so much freer and lighter after that experience. Boy, I just have so much. It would be. A little remiss to contemplate peeling the onion if we didn't think about, what did I call it? Peeling off labels. Peeling off labels. From the moment we were born, parents, friends, society, school, job, all the communities we are part of, give us labels, right? Give me a thumbs up if that's true. Don't you think? Yeah, they give us labels. And some are positive and some are negative. But do they stay with us? Absolutely, they stay with us. A label I got as a very young child because when I, by the time, as some of you know, the language my family speaks is um, sports. I was competitively swimming at eight. And so I have a label, I am an athlete, you know? I don't care, even at my ripe old age, if somebody's over there doing some sport I've never tried, I'll go over and try it, you know? I have the confidence, because I'm an athlete. Peggy and I were laughing about this, and she said, no, not me. <laughs> she was saying she, on that one, she would have the opposite experience. But I have deep in my soul, I have the label, I'm an athlete. And still, I will try surfing. That's one of the things that's still on my bucket list. That I know I can try it. So I have confidence from that. Conversely, and this just makes me so sad, but I've had an albatross around my neck and I've worked so hard on this and it still comes up. I grew up chubby. I was a chubby little athlete. When I was growing up, it seems like athletes were like this big or they were like chunky. I was in fact, a little bit too much like my two and a half year old niece. She looks like a little linebacker. I look like a little small linebacker. And I was called chubby. And I became five foot. That was how tall I am now. And that's how tall I was back then. And my dad would say, Miss five by five who don't measure no more from tip to toe than she do from side to side. And he would say it in front of people. And people would laugh. And I would laugh. And I would go to my bedroom and I would cry. And I would cry. 
And this has been a theme for the whole of my life, distorted body image. When I was 105 pounds and running marathons and coming home with trophies every week and lifting, I was national level for weight. So I was 105 pounds. I still thought I was fat, you know. And so I think we all have labels, both positive and negative. And I did have a process I was going to talk about, but that's another talk. That's another talk. But one of the things that's important to do is sometimes just to write a list, I am, and do a conscious stream of things, just to see all of the I ams that come up in you. Just to see all of those I ams that come up in you. I do a sweet process with children. I talk about, because I don't know an adult that um, doesn't have some negative I ams in their head. You know, and so for positive self-talk, I have I have the children, they write I am and they write a whole list. And then does everybody have a jewel? And if you're at home, just grab something that maybe you look at that is special. I have them write a list of I am all the positives. And then I walk around and they get to say their list and they get to pick a jewel. They get to pick a jewel. So did everybody get one? Okay, cool. So I just want us to do that for a moment. In a moment, I just want you to hold your jewel, just like I do with the students. I want you to close your eyes, and I want you to say as many positive I ams as you can think about, about yourself. So please close your eyes. So I tell my students to put their jewel somewhere where they see it. And every few days, just to pick it up and close their eyes and just say some positive self-talk to ourselves. So that's what I invite you to do with the jewel. Michael? I'd like you to say this after me. I give myself permission to be all I can be. I give myself permission to be all I can be. I give myself permission to live passionate and free. I give myself permission to live passionate and free. Take it away, Michael. I give myself permission to be all I can be. I give myself permission. To be all I can be, I give myself permission to live passionate and free. I give myself permission to be all I can be. I give myself permission to live passionate and free. I give myself permission. All I can be, I give myself permission to live passionate and free. Our deepest fear is not that we are inadequate. Our deepest fear is that we are powerful beyond measure. It is our light, not our darkness, that most frightens us. We ask ourselves, who am I to be brilliant, gorgeous? talented, fabulous. Actually, who are you not to be? You are a child of God. Your playing small does not serve the world. There is nothing enlightened about shrinking so that other people won't feel insecure around you. We were born to make manifest the glory of God that is within us. It is not just in some of us, it is in everyone. And as we let our own light shine, we unconsciously give other people permission to do the same. As we are liberated from our own fear, our presence automatically liberates others. I give myself 
permission to be all I can be. I give myself permission to be passionate and free. I give myself permission to let the light shine. How beautiful is that? How beautiful is that? 